All right, everybody, welcome to our next fave EduCast. I'm super excited about this one. It's always fun to talk ultrasound in clinical applications, education, et cetera, but I feel like we have such a phenomenal team and I've learned over, I've now been chief medical officer for over three years, you blink and time goes by, but I've learned so much from my team. We just were at the World Congress for Ultrasound and Medical Education, and it was fantastic to talk ultrasound ed, and I was able to share some of the pearls I've learned from my team. And so now I want them all, my team, our team, we want them all to be able to share with you. So this is our kind of Wizard of Oz behind the curtain peek. We're not going to give away our secret sauce, sorry. Uh, and we, I promise we won't go into too much physics, but we want to tell you a little bit more about developing product and, and the different roles that we have. So I'm going to introduce everybody and then we have some questions and we're going to we're going to go ahead. So first off, I have Dr. Caroline Zeisberg, who is coming to us from Heidelberg, Germany, one of the most beautiful places in the world. And she's our Senior Director of Clinical Innovation. Caroline has been with us from the nearly the very beginning of the company and is a phenomenal resource. And I look forward to hearing from her. Next up, we have Bobby Anderson, who is our Director of Clinical Insights. He is a sonographer extraordinaire and has the, the magical way of taking clinician and what we see and interpreting that into what our engineers can work with. So now we're going to meet Sultan Weatherspoon, who is our phenomenal. So first of all, I was so excited to have somebody just across the river from me. So Sultan is actually up here in the Pacific Northwest with me. And uh, so he is our lead firmware architect. I had to make sure I said that one too. I've learned a ton about chips and firmware and FPGA. So he's going to make this simple for all of us to understand a little bit more. And finally, we have, uh, so Dr. Steven Rosenzweig, Zweig, did it say it for me, Steven? Rosenzweig. Yeah, I got it. Anyway, uh, so Steven's also up in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, he is in Seattle, and he is our head of ultrasound imaging, having spent many, many, many years down at Duke. So we always get some good um, good Duke love during March Madness and, and elsewhere. So those are introductions and we're now excited to kick it off into the EduCast portion of it. I encourage you to please post your questions via social media. Uh, I think I'll at the end I'll put my email address in there, but feel free to reach out with questions or share your thoughts. Hopefully you find this as interesting as I do when I when I chat with my peeps. So first question is going to be for Caroline and when we walk around, let's say we're at um, a large ultrasound conference, there's so many different kinds of products, small, large, different probes, different AI, different settings, everything. So I'm curious, having been with us for so long, what, how do you decide what to make first and, and why? What goes into decision making on actual product development? Yeah, thanks, Renee. That's a very good question. And when we started building a product, we had so many options, what to build, which features to pull in. And um, what always our goal has been is to have the user in mind and ask users, observe users, watch users use products and understand what their needs are and their um, unmet needs. So when we started with like a big product that was like very early prototype and it wasn't really anything close to what you see today right next to me on the screen. So um, but we took this out and asked users feedback and we did this in many, many ways and talked to many users and tried to build from really the early start on a user base or potential user base at that time because we didn't have a product in the field. So um, that was always really a very like fundamental thing to us to build it around the user need and understand what is the need that the user has. So um, yeah, we went out, we went to people, knocked on the door, sent emails, called them, went to conferences, had um, dinners where we showcased our product or early prototype. And then we iterated on. So we were listening to the users and um, got great feature suggestions. And then like there were some common themes and our goal was not really to build a mini big ultrasound machine basically put a big ultrasound machine in a small format that was never our goal it was really to rethink 
each and every feature that was put into this small machine and is this really something the user really needs or um, how can we make everyone's lives easier? And um, it was very interesting because when we started this company, there weren't many portable devices out there. These days it looks, as you said, a little bit differently, but there were these big bulky machines and we really wanted to bring this mobile experience that you have and that basically everyone now has with their mobile phones um, in everyday life. But in the ultrasound world, that hasn't been the case back in the days. So we really thought, how can we bring this mobile experience also to the ultrasound world and to the user to, um, yeah, to make their lives easier? And to make their lives easier was also important for us to make this usable and user friendly. So usability from the early beginning was something very crucial to us. I love that. Um, one of my favorite examples was Bobby and Ashley, another coworker. They were at Scuff last year, Society for Clinical Ultrasound Fellowships. And someone said, wait, why, why do I have to go to the top of my phone to toggle my exam type? My thumb is at the bottom of my phone. And so the next software, I don't think I'm giving away any secret sauce here, but the next software uh, version will have your, we'll do it at the bottom of, of the device. And so simply being able to watch people, they don't always think, we all do workarounds all the time. I mean, that's what clinical medicine is. Sometimes I feel like like one big workaround. And so being able to watch and observe and, and learn from that is something I've I've learned a lot from. Yeah, and this is also a great example, Renee, for um, it's an iterative process. So we go out and we collect feedback. We, we do this today. We do this all the time and implement the feedback we get. So um, we now have a product in the market, but we are kind of still prototyping to some extent, too, because um, this iterative process where we collect the user's voice and then feed it back into the product is something really exciting. I agree. And the work is never done. So uh, later never on, done. we're going to hear from Sultan how we can actually never done. Uh, improve. Yeah, we, we all agree. The work is never done. And so we'll hear <laughs> some more about how we actually do that. But so next, we're going to kick it to Stephen. And I was hoping you could describe. So you're our, I call you our ultrasound guru, SAR, ninja, the, the, your ultrasound magician. So we come to you, Stephen, and we say, this is what our clinicians need. This is the next thing that we need to build. And my my brain, I can kind of visualize what I want to do with it. But there's about 4,000 steps in between what I think we need in, in doing it. And so I was curious if you would mind illustrating a little bit of what you think about. What are some of the things? I mean, you have to start very high up and go all the way into the details. So I was curious what goes on in your uh, ultrasound magician brain. Sure. Thanks, Renee, for the introduction and the question. I think it starts honestly with asking more questions. Whenever we hear, I want to build this, or we want this device, we want to be able to serve this clinical need. The first thing I want to do is ask those thousands of questions back and get into all of the little details. What are the trade-offs? What are the different um, specific items that they need? I think a great example, um, Caroline, you mentioned this about usability and ergonomics. We look at there's a lot of different size and shapes of the probe face. These are designed for different purposes. But the first question to say, to ask when someone wants to image both the heart as well as the liver is, OK, well, what type of probe face would be able to satisfy both of those imaging conditions? And we start out with the general ergonomic design, the general transducer design for does it need to fit between the ribs? Or do we have a wider footprint that we can see more information into the body? We then also need to think about what are the real imaging needs? How deep into the body do we need to see? What is the smallest structure that we need to see in the body for this particular use case? And each of these has different trade-offs. The deeper into the body that we need to see, the lower frequency transducer we need. But conversely, if we need to see very small structures, very fine details, we need to use a higher frequency to have better resolution. Given all of these trade-offs, it's really core to understand what those user needs are. 
after we have this general picture of what the transducer should look like, the general idea of the frequency based on penetration and resolution, the footprint of the transducer, we then go into a more detailed design of the actual transducer, which is what converts the electrical energy in the in the trans in the system to the pressure or the acoustic energy that goes into the body and then is received back by the system. And this is just the hardware design. There's a lot of other pieces that go into this later down the road for image quality optimization that have to do with taking that received acoustic energy and actually producing an ultrasound image. In doing all of those different steps to build this system, that's where we have to also deal with the trade-offs in the hardware. So the Wave device is very small, it's very lightweight, and it's designed to be low power and not produce a lot of heat. There's trade-offs that we have to be able to produce a high quality ultrasound image with that small device as compared to the big carts, the original systems that Caroline was describing as prototypes. Those have a lot more computational power, a lot more flexibility to produce these awesome ultrasound images. And so one of my main responsibilities as head of ultrasound imaging is to figure out how do we balance those trade-offs, not just from the hardware perspective, but also the signal and image processing to produce that high quality image that our users need, but while making sure that we maintain the right power budget and the right heat budget for our device and for our overall usability. So speaking of trade-offs, the next thing we're working on because our phased array product is lower frequency penetrates in the body is an internist. It's my my bread and butter, my heart, lungs, kidneys, bladder, occasionally even even a baby for teaching. Um, so, but we're you know we're thinking about what's the next product. So let's say we were to be working on a superficial device. What would be some of the things that would go into your uh, thought process on how to design that? Sure, Renee, that's a great question. And there's as we've talked about. Everything in ultrasound is about trade-offs and it's about that balance of understanding the user needs and how our device matches those user needs. So I'll start out with how we designed the phased array initially and then go into what we would do differently for a more superficial transducer. The phased array, and apologies everyone, this will get into the physics a little bit, is designed where it has very small elements in the lateral dimension. So this is the this is the imaging plane that we actually see when you're imaging the body. And we're basically using this as an electronic lens in this dimension. The smaller the distance between those elements in the transducer means the finer control we have over that electronic steering or that electronic lens. This lets us be able to focus the beam across the entire image and have good resolution and be able to see details within the body. The trade-off there is that by using these very small elements, we can only have a small transducer. And so that's where we get the phased array only being about 18 millimeters wide. Whereas when we go into more superficial imaging, users typically want to see a little bit more detail and a little bit wider image, um, as well as the fact that when we make the transducer bigger, we actually have finer resolution or finer detail. And this is an inverse relationship between the size of the transducer and the resolution that we're able to achieve, similar to an idea of a very large um, satellite dish or very large magnifying glass that is able to focus into a very small area, we do the same thing with our sound waves. And so the larger the transducer, the smaller the detail we can see. So for the linear array or for being able to see more superficial structures, we would look at something that's wider, that's m larger than our current phased array to be able to see those finer details as well as increasing the frequency. The trade-off there is that to maintain the same number of elements, the transducer elements actually become much larger 
which means that each one doesn't have as good steering when I was talking about the electronic lens. And so, again, these are the trade-offs that we have to understand the user needs for to be able to meet them. And for example, with a typical linear array, this is why you see the image is just straight down the sides and not steered the way a phased array is because the phased array has much finer control over those electronic lenses that we use across the elements. I love it. Um, again, maybe it's just because I've been doing this for three years now, but I find it like so fascinating to to dig deeper. And I just think so many people, then you pick it up and you use it. And so I hope some of y'all are learning things. So the next question, we'll kick it back a little bit. So uh, we were, I was super, Bob, Bobby here was my my first hire and uh, he's, you've got a great gift at seeing things in an image. My eyes don't even, I don't even comprehend some of the stuff that you're talking about, probably because I'm, you know, just a physician. I'm like, well, I see a heart. And so I was hoping you could describe a little bit of what you're looking for in an image, because since you've been with us, we've been able to do a couple of software releases that have had improved image quality. And later, Sultan's going to tell us how that's possible. But what do you look for? And then how do you communicate it back to our engineers? Yeah, thanks, Renee. Uh, first of all, you're not just a <laughs> not just a doctor. Um, a lot of the physicians we work with uh, give us great feedback on, on the image quality, as well as other things like ergonomics and and uh, user interface. Um, a lot of times, the the language we use is different. So, so I'm sort of a translator at times, where I'll take feedback or I'll see things in the image, and I need to be able to explain that in a way that the engineers can understand. So um, once we've figured out what product that we want to make and and um, the user requirements for that. And then Steven asks his thousand questions and, and puts together the hardware and makes a probe that actually sends a sound wave into the body and receives it and creates an image. That's where I come in and I'll work with our engineers and I'll look at things like like resolution, axial resolution, which is like top to bottom, and 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 how tight are, are the pixels, and how many, how fine of objects can we see that are stacked on top of each other? We'll look at things like frame rate. Um, you know, if you're using cardiac, you need a higher frame rate. Otherwise, the image is going to look blurry. If you're looking at a liver, it doesn't have to be that high of a frame rate because your liver is not moving very much. Uh, we'll look at lateral resolutions, so that's side to side. Sometimes an image can look like the pixels are being stretched or pulled apart. Uh, so we we look at, at at those basic those big things right away and then i'm looking for artifacts i'm looking for noise and when i use the word noise to talk to engineers um I, i'm talking about like a white haze or like a veil that's over the image where you can see your anatomy but there's something in, in between and um sometimes it's harder to see that in some applications versus others. Like if you're looking at a, at a liver, for example, you might not recognize that there's some noise in that image, but then you go to look at a heart with those same settings and uh, your blacks within the heart all of a sudden have these white uh, noise within them. And that can hide anatomy and it can also um, you know, make it look like there's something wrong sometimes when there isn't. So these artifacts are really important for us to look for and to find and to fix. Um, oftentimes the way we do that is we do comparison. Most of the time we have more than one system we're scanning with. Sometimes it's our own system and we're looking at a new product to see if it's the same or better. Other times we're looking at competitors uh, and they all do it too. Um, just to, to we, we may have a gold standard, one that we, we like the image or, or one where we just want to show a comparison. Um, I'll give a good example. Like We had an uh, issue with our image that we had to fix about a year and a half ago where I had noticed there were these little black holes kind of within the image. Um, it's not always easy to see, especially in a cardiac image, because there's already a lot of black in the image from where- And the, my uh, eyes didn't even pick it up. I was like, what is this guy talking about? But because you're yeah. so trained. Yeah. And so I was, I sat with Steven, we sat side by side and scanned with two different systems. One where I could show him uh, our issue with these black holes, one system that did not have the black hole. So it made it a little bit easier to point out and see. And then we have a conversation about what could possibly be causing this and uh, have a few different things we can try to check. And then it's trial and error from there. We, we change a few parameters, we scan again. Did it get better? Did it not get better? Did it get worse? Uh, and eventually we figure out how to solve the problem. And we do that with every problem we find and we just uh, continue to iterate on image quality the same way we would on anything else like uh, user interface or um, or probe design. 
Um, a couple other things that, that we look at when we're doing these things would be a contrast resolution, the blacks and the whites. Um, and it's different per application. If I'm scanning a heart, it's okay to be a more black and white image for a heart. Um, we don't necessarily need it to be uh, very gray uh, because there's the blood within the heart is black and then the, the valves are white. And we, we that contrast resolution being high allows us to see the walls and the, and the valves well. But then if I take those same settings and look at a liver, I may miss like a small discrete nodule. We want more shades of gray when we're scanning the liver so we can pull out these nodules and these lesions and separate them from the surrounding liver tissue, which can often have similar echogenicity. So uh, one other thing, Bobby, is that a small company, you're both the translator with the engineers and the clinicians, but also out there traveling with me and some of our other team for meetings. And I'm curious, are there, you mentioned the noise. There's, it's almost in my head, like dizziness. My patient says dizziness, but that could mean 10 different things. So how do you, if you wanted to tell one of the clinicians watching, if they have a beef with something or they want to give feedback, how would you, what are like your best, like teach us how to talk to you or like, what do you, um, I don't know, is there anything you wish that we all knew to give you the most uh, effective feedback for you to keep making things better? Yeah, that's a great question. Because like I said, a lot of people use different language. Uh, first of all, I would just encourage feedback a, a, of any type. Use whatever language that you can to try to describe the issue or the problem that you have. Um, we are always out seeking feedback, but not often do people, uh, users and clinicians come to us and say, hey, I have your product and I've noticed this. Um, one of the, the terms I hear get thrown around a lot is uh, grain or graininess. And I, I've heard people use the term grainy to describe a lot of different things. But uh, for us, as we're developing um, graininess to me and to the engineers, when we speak about it, is like the black dots on the whites. It's like ants on a log. And so there are filters uh, that we can put in place that can remove that that graininess. Sometimes we want it in certain images and other times we, we want to remove it. And then sometimes that's also just a matter of preference. Um, and then something like noise, which sometimes gets called graininess, would be that white veil of haze. Those are two of the bigger things that you see. Um, also, you know, re resolution and frame rate can get kind of mixed up. If somebody sees a blurry image, they're not quite sure why. Um, sometimes it's because the frame rate isn't good enough and, and you don't have enough frames per second like a television and you're watching in standard definition when we want to be seeing in high definition. And then other times it's resolution. We don't have uh, we have too big of pixels or um, our frequency isn't quite right and we're not getting as high of a resolution as we want. Uh, but it's also okay to just describe whatever phenomenon you see. And I do that with engineers too. I've, I've used terms like pixel dancing when I can see like a fluttery motion um, and uh, on the screen. And sometimes that's like a, a, a product of noise and, and the noise can be distracting because it's actually moving around in part of the image. All right. Well, I love it. We are on to our final speaker. I forgot to mention a huge uh, thank you to you, Caroline, because I think, what is it? Uh, 11 40 p.m your time it's it's late it's so. 10 40 so it's not as bad but <laughs> yes well thank you for joining us anyway um uh yeah despite the the late timing so now it's time for our um software firmware fpga magic and the another benefit of being a small time team is that we often get to travel together so Tor University of Nevada is a school where all the second year students get devices. And so I first heard Sultan speak about what he does. I was like, I, I'm just so confused. There's so many chips and there's so much stuff. And so I first uh, at, a, at a beautiful crepe lunch, if you want to know the name of it in Henderson, Nevada, message me. But I got mm -hmm. to hear him talk about what he does. And to me, the concept was so novel. The same hardware, nothing in the hardware changes yet we're able to have drastically different image quality. And so I was hoping you'd mind um, breaking it down for the users on, on what your uh, magical skill is. Yes, so uh, most people have never heard of what an FPGA is. It's basically just a programmable chip. And it's probably one of two components that allows portable ultrasound to happen. And so ultrasound, the Bobby mentions image quality and noise and, and whatnot. And so from a chip designer, that's what an FPGA programmer really is, is just a chip designer. 
from my perspective, it's all about really timing and plumbing. And so when he says that I see this black hole or I see this noise, when I ask where in the image is it, basically I'm asking where in time. For, so his translation is really good. Mine is for more techie engineers. But he says that it's floating in the top right corner when I do X. And so that means to me, my translation is in a certain amount of time, something is happening. Something is either going wrong or, um, but it's all related to time. And so when you program a chip, all information comes in from ultrasound essentially with an expiration date or expiration time on it. So it's only useful for a certain amount of time and then you package it up and you send it off to the app or whatnot. And the um, I like to make a comparison that it's it's like plumbing, but really like plumbing for like a dairy farm. That you have this flow of milk coming in and you want to package it up. Um, when it comes in, you have to put a time step on it. It's got to go someplace, whether it's, uh, you know, however you want to make it into cream or milk or whatever, but it's got that expiration on it as it comes in. And the FPGA allows all this processing to happen in real time within the literally microseconds we have to process the information and then make this beautiful image. So, Stephen, this is getting a little bit out of my wheelhouse. So uh, I'm going to have you ask Sultan the next question so it sounds smarter. <laughs> sure. So I think one of the amazing things about what you do, Sultan, is how much data we have coming into the system. And you mentioned processing it in microseconds. Can you go into a little bit more detail of exactly how much data is coming into the system, how long you have to process it? And as we talked about before, going to a more superficial imaging scenario, what would need to change to be able to enable that technology? Yes, so that's a great question. Um, and I will say that when you look at the data rate, uh, again, we always have to go back to the data rate and how much time we have to process it. So ultrasound in the body, travels, I think, about two, uh, two kilometers per second into the body or something like that. So when you meters per second on average. Yeah, yeah. I so was going to say, that's another Stephen or Bobby in, question, not a doctor question. <laughs> oh, man. This, so it comes back out. So what I'm looking okay. at is, is, is a wave of data. And we have, as Stephen had mentioned earlier, we have all these elements. So each one of these elements essentially is giving us part of that data. So if you look at, uh, if you were to connect some, you know, you had, let's say, uh, 64 computers connect to the internet, each one streaming a different video. Now you have to process it, okay, I'm processing each, each of those elements individually on, this, on one, just one chip. And I need to process it within essentially one cycle, one wave, full wave of the ultrasound. So you're looking at, you know, around, typically around a couple of microseconds, millionths of a second. All that processing has to be on one, one chip. And the other component of all chip design is power. It's really clocks and power, so time and power. And so it allows us to happen in the portable probe is that we have one small chip that is low power and this one chip is essentially processing all the data coming in for every element all in real time and how about um so firmware would you mind um because this is something the first time again we were having lunch and i went through my little book of i write down every word i don't know <laughs> it's like the beginning mm -hmm. of medical school and so would you be able to uh, tell everybody what firm what does firmware actually mean? Like, what's the definition of firmware? So firmware is any programming code that deals directly with the hardware. So directly with the, as we would call the transducer, 
uh, directly with the um, buttons and different things like that. So you have that firmware that really it, it programs the chip. It's right. It sits right on top of it. And what most people know is software is an app. So an app is it asks the chip to do something, whereas the firmware basically controls the chip. OK, chip, you're going to do this, whereas the, the app will you know, play a video or something like that. We're, work, we're working with the raw data. And so we have to interpret it so that something that's on your phone can make an image. So the image that goes to the, the data that goes to the uh, app on our phone or on the device, it's really just a bunch of ones and zeros and some uh, like a almost like a book. It gives you a book with some chapters and and then the app interprets it and puts it on a on a screen. Whereas we're just putting the letters down. All the letters, it's uh, you know. It takes a lot longer to do what we're doing um, because it's just more information. It still fascinates me, all of it. So um, anyone, this one's up for grabs. So when we, so when our um, new soft, you know, when our new platform is is launched and of course there's regulatory stuff, next time maybe we'll get our fabulous coworker Sandia to talk about some of the regulatory aspects because medical devices are very different and there's the hardware but this came up at the conference there's actually samd or software as a medical device so the software is actually interpreting it without your phone we have no image and so we have to actually go through regulatory processes with software releases too but let's say we push a new software release and it's when we did this for Bobby's fantastic, uh, his image quality improvement. So like, how does that happen? What, um, again, anyone, like what is what is going on when you download the software on your phone and it says updating firmware? Like what's, what's happening in the probe? So maybe this is a you question again, Sultan. I will let, um, I'll answer the first part and I'll let Steven answer the uh, second Perfect. part. But when okay. you say update your uh, probe, um, so that that's updating the firmware on the probe, and a lot of times, so there's it's two two packages. One is just on the probe itself, and that does everything from update the timing, uh, the filters, the beamformer, um, any number of things there. But I'd like to say that uh, you know. Um, the best definition I can give someone of what firmware does is when we turn on the probe and you get the green light, that means it works. So one green light and the, all this complication is like, OK, it's on and it works. And that's essentially what the download very simple does is it makes sure that the green light keeps on coming back on when you turn it on, when you push the button. I'll let I love it. Steven. Steven, answer. next step now. <laughs> yeah, so what is the probe doing when it has that green light when it connects? And a lot of that is exactly what you said, Sultan. It's about setting up the clock, setting up the beam former, setting up the filters. So when, Bobby, you were talking earlier about some of the image quality changes or um, artifacts that we were seeing that we wanted to improve and reduce, well, what we're really doing is adjusting most of those parameters, whether that's values going to other pieces of hardware, such as the analog front end, and we're changing the gain values being written to that integrated circuit through the FPGA, or we're changing back end filters, such as how much persistence we're applying to the image to reduce blur in the image in a cardiac scenario. And so a long translation. Pers persistence sure. <laughs> is, a, is, a, is an averaging of, over time. You can think of it as taking a few different frames and combining them into an image. It's a way to smooth out an image and, ma and make it look a little bit nicer to the eye. But if you're not careful, it'll make it really blurry. Uh, and then when you were talking about um, time gain compensation, TGCs or analog gains, um, I think a lot of users are familiar with what like a TGC is. You can change the gain at different parts of the screen. We can do that internally as well. So ideally, we give you a good starting point by setting it internally to something that works well on like an average uh, amount of 
different people. And then you would have to change it based off of different patient body habits and situations like that. So go ahead, continue, Steve. No, See, this I'm is, a this is why Bobby is our master <laughs> <So> translator. <laughs> translator. Um, so what's happening when you download this new software package is we do get the updated firmware for the the chip in the probe, but we also get all of these new imaging settings. They're able to recontrol what the hardware is doing as well as what our signal and image processing is doing to improve the image quality for the user. So we take all of those pieces, as, as Bobby, you just alluded to, trying to get it to work well for the average body habitus. And then we put all of that into a set of information for how to control the hardware and how to process the data to display that final image. And all of that comes together in one package with the new software. Okay, well, I love it. I think one of the, the big take home messages before I kick it to Caroline for her last reflections is that it takes a village. Uh, we are a small yet mighty team. And one thing that I learned from, from all of this when I was earlier on was that the sky's the limit with image quality, uh, with classic PZT based imaging. And we've got Bobby, our translator. We've got Steven, our ultrasound magician. But we always need we always need new team members. And so we're actually right now, if you're an ultrasound scientist or know any fabulous ultrasound scientists, I would love we all want to be working on new products and continuing to make our product even better. So uh, hit Steve, we'll say hit Steven up if you're an ultrasound engineer, ultrasound scientist, and um, taking it back to to you all, our customers or clinicians. Carolyn, I was curious, now that you've been with the company for so long, but also as a clinician, what what's like one thing that you wish you had known or, or one other piece about what we do that you would love for clinicians to know? So I had said, your key opinion leaders, we need your feedback. Bobby had echoed that. Is there anything else that you wish that people knew about what we do with industry, what we do with devices or, or anything different? Something just very interesting comes to my mind that I personally find so exciting and amazing. And it's what we just talked about. We are such a um, cool team with very, people from very different backgrounds and mm -hmm. I think um, having such a diverse team talking about problems and problems is probably the wrong word but talking about challenges brings up so much creativity and energy and really cool things come out of that so coming from a yeah clinical background and working in a hospital I often felt like I'm just surrounded by other clinicians, which is not true. And it's a very diverse like world, too. But I love in industry that we are such a diverse team with different backgrounds and everyone is speaking up and everyone has the, has the same right to speak up. And um, here we are a lot of engineers, but we also have designers and clinicians and um, office managers and everyone has to say something and has a very valuable perspective. So yeah, that brings up a lot of creativity and power. I love it. I feel like that's just drop the mic. I, I think that's got to be it, right? Um, so thank you all so much. Thank you, Caroline, for being up so late. And I'm just really grateful Any anyone and everyone watching this. We are just excited to uh, be here, hear from you, and I'm glad you got to see a little bit more behind the curtain. And so hopefully next time you are scanning, teaching, anything else, uh, pay, pay a little closer attention. Think about how that happens. Feel free to send us feedback and um, we're on all the socials and whatever anyway. So uh, we'll be having a new Faces of Pocus. We'll be dropping soon on our website and some other cool stuff. So yeah, stay tuned. It's been It's been a pleasure. And thank you all again. Thank you. Thanks, Renee.